Salutations, everybody. It is Maddie here today with episode 215 of the Ham Radio Podcast. And it is not me, Carrick from ACG. You're stuck with me again. Guess what? Deal with it. I'm just kidding. So pretty much the reason we're doing yet another solo show, but this time, don't worry, we're not on a Monday. We're sticking with our Sunday schedule. That is officially back in place for the remainder of the show's lifetime. But the reason I'm doing another solo show is because as you're listening to this, actually, I'll be heading back from said vacation, but I am going to be on vacation. I thought now was a good time in the summer to recharge my batteries, go away with my girlfriend for a couple of days, and uh, just recollect myself before a very big announcement for my channel that I think is really going to to change the course of what I do here in a very positive manner. And also, the fall is always insanely busy with all those reviews I produce. So I'm really looking forward to that, but I need to make sure my battery is charged. So I'm taking some time off, but obviously, as you guys have noticed at this point in time, there was content up every single day of the week for my Borderlands 3 event. And just like what I did with the Outer Worlds event, I wanted to make sure I grabbed all of your questions off of Twitter. We have roughly 30, so I'm going to be flying right through them, and uh, I'm going to answer all of them. So that's why it's a solo show. I felt it worked out in Carrick's advantage. He really appreciated the break two weeks ago, and so I figured, hey, man, take another week off. You know, we do this show all the time. It's not like anything's going wrong. We're just, you know taking a different approach to how uh, flexible we can make the schedule. And maybe if we eventually add a third host again, um, we won't have to do these solo shows. But since people seem to enjoy what I did with The Outer Worlds and how I structured that podcast, it was a little more loose, a little more freeform, and just based around you, the audience, the listeners, um, I guess we don't see like a strong reason right now. But don't worry, we're we're still looking into a third host. It's just a, a very big void to fill. Anyway, let's get this started. I'm over on Twitter at G27Status if you ever want to get involved in these types of shows because I imagine this won't be the last one that we do. But here we go. At Satchel Seals, my boy Satchel, he asks, are there any new rarities in the game? So I was doing a little bit of hunting around and I remembered back when they dropped the Happy Together trailer, we found out that there was a ton of new stuff being added to the Vault Insider program and some of them were weapons from the commander lilith and fight for sanctuary dlc and that did include some of the new rarities that were introduced in that borderlands 2 dlc so i personally believe they're not going to go ahead and add just rarities for said dlc Uh, maybe gearbox really just wants to sling it around and act like the big shot and go yeah we'll just put this new rarity only in borderlands 2 we're not going to do it in 3 because we have all this money to flick into these systems but i personally think you can expect to see those rarities in the game especially if the vault insider program supporting them i don't think it makes sense just to reserve it for dlc in the terms of my own experience though i did not get my hands on any of these new rarities i didn't even see a legendary weapon outside of the one that they already kitted me out with on Eden 6, which was like a chain gun. It was awesome. It was such a cool weapon. Uh, Naturally, in Borderlands fashion, those types of weapons are always excellent. But as for any new rarities in the game outside of that, I am not aware of. There may be that as well, but I didn't get my hands on anything. I didn't find out anything. The next one comes from Data Late, another frequent stream viewer. All all these first couple of questions are all from frequent stream viewers, and I love it. I really appreciate that because that means that we can like develop relationships and I can actually know who each of you are who's communicating with me. It's awesome. And he asks, what can we expect in terms of endgame and raid boss design strategy, arena design, etc.? So this is something I can't really answer because I never got my hands on any end game content. Uh, we know very little about the end game in Borderlands 3 other than the Guardian ranks, which we'll unlock after we beat the main story, which I thought was really interesting. But you can see in the transparent menu, there's an enforcer tree, a survivor tree, a hunter tree. And you can see these little percentage buffs like uh, bonus stats for gun damage, rate of fire, what have you. And I think that type of stuff is going to be Really interesting to see how it carries on the game, but overall, that's all we actually do know. And so, I kind of like that. I kind of like that there's going to be a surprise for Borderlands 3 when it comes to beating the game. You really don't know what's going to happen. Um, will there just be missions that we can run over and over again, like raids? I don't know. But to directly answer your question, Data Late, I cannot actually do so. <laughs> so, let's move on to at enter username who asks, has the game changed since the PAX? demo and i imagine you're thinking of in may when i traveled out myself and a ton of other content creators all went to hollywood to play borderlands 3 during its reveal event and we streamed it and made tons of videos and that was all good stuff 
So how has the game changed since then? Uh, simply put, it hasn't. I don't think there was enough time, just game development wise, for any changes to be put into place. Um, the reason I say that is because I played it in May, the game's coming out in September, and then I played it again two and a half months later for a much more extensive period of time. And while I walked away with a lot more things to take away, like different quality of life changes, like for example, the quest changer, where you can press left or right on the D-pad, the little countdown that's in the audio for your skills when they're on cooldown. We learned a lot more about the story. There was details like that I could take away, but in the terms of actual substantial change, I didn't notice anything and it seemed very much like the same game I was playing back in May, which was good because if you guys remember, uh, my opinion on that with the brutally honest opinion video, I think like, what, 750,000 people have seen it now? It's really cool. And uh, it, it still remains extremely positive. I had a blast playing it back then. I had a blast playing it just a couple of weeks ago. So it's good it hasn't changed. Uh, I did notice a couple of things that were gripes. Like I said, the early game guns. Uh, this is just stuff that's a part of the whole experience. I played a specific portion of the game in May. Uh, this time I got my hands on an entire prologue, which had a little bit of interesting power scaling, and then I hopped into the mid-game where they had more of a predefined build for me. Um, well, not really a build, I should say, because I got to pick all my skills, but they had more of a predefined weapon loadout. Anything I looted wouldn't have been better than what they gave me, which is interesting because one of the things I really, really complimented with Borderlands 3 was its gunplay. It was very Destiny-esque. Uh, remind me, Call of Duty even, I'd say, as and I say that in a complimentary way, by the way. Um, I really, really like the gunplay in both those titles, and so it's good to see Borderlands 3, with all of its RPG elements, be able to mimic the gunplay for those titles. So ultimately, there hasn't been any significant changes, or really any I'd noted at all, since the gameplay preview I had back in May, and that's a good thing. Uh, Lee at Fallout 4 is life. A patron asks, what level will you reach when you get toward the end game? And is there a new game plus feature at launch? So yeah, the new game plus feature I was talking about was in fact the guardian ranks that's going to unlock after you complete all the story missions. Um, in fact, I'm looking at the menu right now and it says return after completing all of the story missions for more rewards. So this is just something that's set up for us to continuously scale our character once we finish it and I believe it's just replacing those badass ranks and they're reserving it for the end game which I, I think is kind of smart because what happens in Borderlands 2 and I'm not saying it's a bad system by any means but as you're leveling up and you're seeing more of the changes come in the form of the skills on the skill tree where you're putting points in there whereas when you started getting those badass tokens you wouldn't notice like a five percent difference in your reload speed by the end game that's just something so gradual but if you reach the end game and you get these guardian ranks and i don't know how quickly they scale do you get like one guardian rank token per level or is this something that scales on its own and also i did note that there were challenges that were being completed when playing borderlands 3 but whenever i press the menu to open them it didn't take me to anything specifically, so I wonder if those challenges are linked to the Guardian rank, which then, when you beat the game, you can just spend all these tokens to your heart's content. That would be interesting, but ultimately, what level will you reach when you uh, get toward the end game? Well, they put me in at level 22, I want to say, and they said that was the mid-game, and that was on Eden 6. So if that's mid-game, I'd imagine you're hitting the 40s, maybe the 50s, when you get to the end game, which sounds about right, but it depends also what you define as end game. Do you define end game as in I beat the story? What level am I by the time I beat the story? Or do you define end game as in post main story, replaying the game again and going through that way? Um, because then that, that sort of changes things up a little bit. Anyway, we have Start Button Game asking, they stated Borderlands 3 would be different in terms of tone. How have you seen this in your experience and is it an improvement or just different? What elements in regard to tone have carried over and what has changed? Thanks, dude. Well, thank you for a very detailed question and I always love answering these story questions and it's a good time to ask story questions because like I said, I played three hours of the prologue. I really got a good taste of the villains, of the setup for the game, uh, for the tone of the game. Uh, it was very reminiscent, I'd say, in a sense of Borderlands 2, and I mean that in a good way. Uh, and I don't mean that by Handsome Jack, though, constantly cracking sarcastic jokes over the echo. Um, it reminded me of Borderlands 2, and the tone of the world was very dire, 
very serious. The people around you, the music was very serious, but then the characters were sort of the uplifting glimmer of light amongst all that, where you meet Lilith, you see Vaughn again, he's hanging upside down by his underwear. You're like, what is going on, man? You see some wacky stuff. So just like any Borderlands game, there's that cross between dark and humor. Uh, Not like you see in Fallout, for example, but I'd say tonally, it's a lot more relevant to modern society because both of your villains are these internet stars, essentially. They're like, what's up, everybody? And they're streaming everything and they're posting everything online. And this helps unite all of these bandits together for a reason I won't spoil because I I don't want to ruin anything in the introduction for anybody. And if you want to know what I'm talking about, it is in my Brutally Honest Opinion video. I have timestamps there. You can go ahead and listen so I can specify more on story details. But I want to make sure for our listeners here, I don't ruin anything because this is mainly an audio driven experience. But Overall, the the tone isn't all over the place, which is good. It's uh, like, for example, I did a side quest. Marcus goes, hey, uh, we need to power this thing on. You can either use a skag spine or if you want, you can use a human spine because it it transfers electricity better. And and getting a human spine became an optional objective. So I ran over to a bandit camp after getting the skag spine. I killed a human for like one of the bandits. I grabbed his spine, I ran back to this little power conduit, and I put the human spine in there, and the human spine disintegrates, and all you hear is Marcus laughing over the echo, and he's like, I just wanted to get that guy back for trying to rip me off. Now go ahead and put the skag spine in. So the game sort of plays with your expectations. It's very crafty with the way it delivers its quest objectives, and so you can expect that type of humor there where, you know, they, they, in a comedic fashion, deliver something very grim, like, Jesus, I just ripped this guy's spine out to put it in a power conduit, and it was just for some dude to be vengeful. I think that type of stuff is, is hilarious in games, and so I, I'm glad that they're taking that direction with it, but, you know, during my interview with the co-lead writers of Borderlands 3, they seem to be um, stating that the comedy was a, a little more scattered because everyone had their own interpretation of Borderlands, everyone had their own deliveries of comedy which can be a good thing because for me uh i'm an easy target mostly for for a lot of laughs um even though i'm a relatively i'd say serious guy when i game like i'm usually pretty stern but when it comes to movies like i'll I'll laugh at a fart joke man like i'm a pretty (laughs) i'm a pretty easy target so when if they're going across the spectrum that's fine but some people like a very specific humor in borderlands um like handsome jack paying you to kill yourself that that type of dark stuff um but that's also executed in a very interesting uh i guess funny fashion it's like wow did they really just go there i guess would be the best way to say it um i didn't experience any of that level in borderlands 3 but uh i guess it's so far separated itself mainly from its villains who are these internet stars so i think internet culture will sort of dominate the comedy for this game and um it seemed like the storytelling was very serious when they when they wanted to tell and deliver a big part of the narrative they like stopped the game they did a cut scene uh, it just wasn't like we'll say Mordecai with Bloodwing where it's all happening over the echo and you're sort of watching it unfold in the gameplay um i i find it interesting that Borderlands is transferring into more of a cutscene driven story which which is good because there'll be a break between this is serious and this is comedy so i think that's good for everybody Um, let's keep on scrolling. We have Rositer Nathan who asks, as flat, can you pet the spider ant and the jabber? Now that's interesting because I remember seeing when you could go next to one of your pets, you could press X to pet them. I know you could do it with the skag, but can you do it with the spider ant and the jabber? I I don't know. I actually do not know. Uh, I'm pretty sure you can because they, they do this funny sound when you press X and they sort of respond to it. What's the name of the skag? Like Mr. Chow or something like that? I don't know. I, I thought that type of stuff's funny. That's the little personality that you love to see in Borderlands. Uh, speaking of skags, Slinky Guy asks, how does the skag die in the intro? Now, I may have played the whole prologue, but I was literally dropped in right where we saw the Borderlands 3 reveal event. So what happens is the prologue loads up right where it started for all of us. We, we just see the the i think what is it like claptrap waving to you you sign the eula you you hit the switch you go through a bunch of like broken down cars in a scrapyard um so i didn't see what happened and how the skag died in this intro which is uh which is pretty pretty good i'd say because that that sets the tone for the start of your playthrough i'm all about tone setting if you couldn't tell 
Um, Pariah Mentality asks, will enemies scale to your level rather than it depending on the area you were in like before? This is a major issue of mine in Borderlands 2 because I had a friend who's level 40 and I'm level 20 and there's nothing you can do other than hide. Uh, good news for you, Pariah, is that yes, there is scaling. So it goes based off what your level is. So let's say you're level 40 and your friend's level 20. Your friend's going to be shooting level 20 enemies. You're going to be shooting level 40 enemies. So don't worry. Co-op with different levels in different areas will be fine. So if your friend's a little bit behind, you're ahead of them. It lets you play by yourself pretty much. And, and and they can get off, they can do whatever they got to do, and then when they get back, you can just go into their file, and you can help them out there, so really good stuff there. Um, how much do the other games factor into Borderlands 3, including Tales from the Borderlands? Um, it instantly references Borderlands 2, because it's continuing directly after that. Um, you see Vaughn right away from uh, Tales from the Borderlands, so I'd say it takes from all aspects of Borderlands, which is, which is really good news, and I think that's what's going to make it a big celebration of this franchise when this game comes out. Um, Epic, hold on, wait, that's your name, but your handle is Go Away Outlander. <laughs> uh, he, <laughs> I love some of these handles, man. Uh, are there any Borderlands 2 Vault Hunters besides Maya and Zero in Borderlands 3? It's a long shot, but I want to know so badly. So, uh, I don't know if you had a chance by this point to check out my interview on Borderlands 3. I made sure the first thing that was mentioned in my list of subjects I covered was returning characters because I knew a lot of people wanted to know about returning characters in Borderlands 3. It was my favorite interview I've ever done. If you haven't had a chance to listen to it, I mean, these guys were so funny. They were Sam and, and I think David was his name. I apologize. I, I can't believe I forgot his name, but I'm sometimes really bad with names. But, uh, just really loose guys, really honest, transparent answers. Um, they didn't dance around it with PR decorated statements. They were they were very, you know, honest and, and straightforward, and I, I like that. But anyway, um, they did say that they're not going to kill any characters off screen. Uh, this was something that was being speculated about quite a bit, given the fact that like we hadn't seen Axton or Salvador or um, the Mecronancer, the Mecromancer, sorry. Um, so don't worry, I, they're not dead, presumably, based off that interview. Uh, I imagine they're going to come back at different points in the story, but we have to also realize Gearbox is doing the right thing here. They're not confirming every single damn thing. They're keeping a lot close to their chest, and I like that. Thank you, because every trailer spoils every single thing, and well, while I was a little bit upset that, you know, a little bit about Lilith, my favorite character in the entire series, um, got revealed during... Uh, one of the trailers, and it was very obvious what happened, and I think it was a pretty big story moment that no one really needed to know, um, because it, it, it's still, you could set the tone that this is a very big intergalactic adventure, and we've got Sanctuary 3, and we're going to all these different planets without spoiling what happened to Lilith. That, that bugged me a little bit, but overall, um, they've kept most of the stuff close to their chest, and I'm very happy about that. Uh, what is the new inventory system like? Do you prefer Borderlands 3 or Borderlands 2, Synth Potato asks. So, you know, it's funny you ask that. Because whenever... Because here's the thing. When you're at a preview event like this, you don't... You want to make every minute count. So I can bring you guys like those almost 20 minute full breakdowns of my experience because I want to be taking notes. Like I want to be stopping the game for that, to take notes, to make sure I have all my experience documented so I can reference it because, you know, there's travel in between, there's stuff that happens in real life in between, um, there's the production process. So you want to make sure that as you experience things, you're taking notes. That's what I want to stop the game for. So when I'm in the inventory systems in these types of games, like Borderlands 3, and I know, for example, the game's going to set me up with, uh, or rather the team who's bringing the game is going to set me up with the best possible build in the, in the mid-game portion of the title. I don't like to spend much time just messing around in the inventory because right now that's irrelevant to my experience because I know, like I said, that mid-game part, there's nothing I'm looting that's better than what I have. So I was in the inventory for the early three hours um, and it's, how do I word it? Like, it felt weird. I don't know, like when I went to go compare stuff, I thought there'd be a compare button, but you have to click it to equip it and then you have to hover over one of the weapons that you have equipped and then it'll compare those stats and it makes sense and it's not something that's going to be a major adjustment but just initially I was very confused like I thought there would be a button just to strictly compare um when you're going through your your backpack they're organized now in I think it's item rank 
So when you complete a quest, it'll say blue sniper 197. And now the backpack's organized by that power. So you look for 197. It still has, don't worry, don't get me wrong, it still has like a weapon name. It still has like its own separate stats and special abilities if it's one of those unique weapons. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's organized in a strange manner. So you'll find like a grenade mod in there at like 196. And then you'll find a shield at like 182. Get what I'm saying? It, it gets, it makes sense in the terms of item number. But w what I noticed was it was a little messy this way. Um, but like I said too, I, I want to be fair and say that I, I did not spend enough time in there trying to equate myself because what would happen is I'd try to figure it out and because it wasn't very like immediate, like, like, okay, I don't get this right now and I don't have time. I want to make sure like I'm playing the game because, you know, I wanted to complete the entire prologue section. I wanted to complete the entirety of Eden 6 that was available to me. I didn't finish the whole planet because they didn't let you do that. Um, they stopped you at a certain point, but, uh, I wanted to make sure I did what I could because I know what ultimately mattered was not inventory management and me messing around in menus, but rather stuff like story, gameplay, character development, um, that type of stuff. Justice for 199 asks, rate the soundtrack one to 10, one being just static white noise and 10 being a masterpiece better than Doom 2016. <laughs> Man, uh, let's think here. Sanctuary 3's track was is easily up there with one of my favorite Borderlands tracks, just like Flame Flame Rock Refuge for the Tiny Tina DLC. Um, mm, yeah, I'm I can't rate the whole thing. Obviously, the the Eden Six soundtrack was a little more primal in nature. Pandora was a lot more uh, reminiscent of what we've heard before, like from Firestone and whatnot. You know, like you could hear like boom, 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 boom like kind of drums almost. And so I feel like every planet is going to have their own feeling themes. And uh, I feel like I needed to, to experience the whole game and get fully immersed into it to, to identify the, the soundtrack better. Um, because there's a difference between like a near automata standout track with vocals where you can listen to this no matter what moment you're in and go, that is a really good soundtrack or persona even uh, versus this game, Borderlands 3, where... Uh, it's very much those those the the musical pieces are driven by moments and and the in between exploration and immersion that type of stuff. Um, so let's keep scrolling. Arch Cools asks, "Does Claptrap do the dab in the game?" I'm sure at some point he does. I would not be surprised. Parker Bing one asks, "Ellen Musk, flamethrower." Uh, did not get my hands on that one. I do apologize. Uh, great question here from Plasma99. How is the character banter? So I did not play in co-op, as I mentioned in my solo play video. I did not play anything online with people because I wanted to know, hey, can you play the single player? Uh, so I don't know if I'm in a co-op session, if I'm going to be bouncing back and forth with one of my companions during set sections of the game, which would be a really cool touch. I hope that they do do that, and I think they will because... Um, when you're doing quests, your companions, you're not your companions, but your character, um, actually responds directly to what people are saying. So it makes that person that you're playing as feel a little more lifelike. And I, I like that a lot. You're not just someone with a set of skills and that's all that defines you, but rather they have a personality. Um, and I think voicing these characters and giving them a lot of interactions with the quests. I do apologize for my dog, by the way, he's being a loud mouth. Um, but yeah, the, the character banter overall was solid. It was usually um, just reactions. I played as Flack, who was a lot more serious, um, and Moe's I didn't get enough time with to get a real feel for her personality. I'll be honest, I didn't know if she was going to be goofy. I I thought I thought that's kind of what she'd be like, but I almost started to get this vibe like she was a lot more serious than I expected. And maybe that's because she's sort of the suitor suit well suitor Jesus pseudo soldier class. That's a tongue twister. Say that ten times fast. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the overall. Flack was serious, so wasn't a ton of banter there. Uh, one of his funniest lines was the way he reacted to meeting Mad Moxie, because because then Ellie like chimed in and she was like, "Can you just like stop foaming at the mouth over this girl and just get it on with?" Uh, so it, stuff like that, that type of interaction was good, because uh, you had a feeling your character would say something about Moxie. It's just a matter of what, and uh, the way they executed it was was still great. Faith interlude asks. Er Faith Interlude asks, are any previous Vault Hunters we haven't seen yet returning in DLC? They also hinted towards that 
in my interview session with the co-lead writers for Borderlands 3. Um, so I think that may be where you see some characters that will be missing from the story. Um, while I don't like having that, I also sort of understand it because that's a lot of cameos to balance because it becomes something like, we'll say Marvel Ultimate Alliance 3 where like everybody gets like five seconds of their screen time and, and it's to satisfy like one specific gamer across the globe everywhere. And so I feel like it's smarter just to reserve certain Vault Hunters for like their very specific moments. Um, I, I think that's a good choice, but at the same time, I think some fans will be upset because uh, that, that seems to be the route that they're taking and, and, and no one likes to pay for stuff that, you know, they, they want access to so badly in the base game. All right, so we got Not Your Pie asking, how seamless is the game talking about loading screens between planets and places? Uh, this is interesting that you asked this because it's one thing I did note in the back of my head. Uh, I never thought it was a really worthy talking point because I was playing on PC, so the loading screens were quick. Um, but it's very much just like Borderlands 2 or Borderlands the pre-sequel or Borderlands 1. You, you go up to like a wall, you press X or you press square, and you see the countdown if you're playing in co-op, which I've seen on other computers, and if not, uh, it just enters a loading screen right away. You see like a little concept art, you see what location you're entering, uh, and then you load in and, and boom, it picks up again. I think the difference here is that they could have made the entire planets open, but what they decided to do instead was create more dense areas uh, with tons of content and so you, you could run around them for a while doing quests before you had to enter any loading screens. When it came from going to Sanctuary 3 uh, from Pandora, there was a short loading screen there. Um, and, and once again, Sanctuary 3 was a very big hub. So even if there was a somewhat lengthier loading screen, it, it made sense because uh, it was dense. You know, density is sort of the name of the game. Like Pandora is a very big hub area. Uh, there's tons of quests there. There Was there... I think there was two sections to Pandora. I think there was like Ascension Bluff and then like the general Pandora area, if I recall correctly. Um, so it's still split up into multiple parts, but I didn't notice any long screen loading screens. And I don't think the PC rig I was playing on was the best because as I mentioned previously in videos and I believe in this show as well, um, that there were FPS drops. So there isn't really a seamlessness in the terms of like, entering areas they're still loading screens so i to answer that i wouldn't say it is seamless it's, it's kind of abrupt like it has been in previous borderlands games um and i think that'll be the last question because yeah goldcast asked how do vault hunters of the past games play into the game are they just npcs or are they playable so um i sort of answered the first one um but they are just npcs they're not playable um, Gearbox sort of iterated that they want to expand. Well, they, they, they rather Randy Pitchford expressed he wants to expand on current characters instead of creating new ones. And I think that also hints at the fact that he wants to leave some of those characters in the past. And I think that'll make some story moments a lot more impactful because I'm sure not every character in Borderlands 3 is going to live. I think that was one of the stronger parts of Borderlands 2. And so in turn, if you made will say Lilith playable and Lilith dies. It doesn't really make sense why Lilith is going to be running around post Lilith death, right? So I feel like they're going to keep them NPCs no matter what. Um, I feel like that's just the right choice as much as I kind of wanted initially for them to make it a huge Borderlands playable cast. Like you could pick from all previous Borderlands games, whoever you want to play as on top of four new ones. I think that would have been insanity. I thought that would have been the route they had taken for sure, but they, they took the classic route, four brand new Vault Hunters um, that feel completely different from one another, which I don't think is a bad thing by any stretch of the imagination. I just thought with how big this game is, you, you just they're doing everything, man. You just thought that that would be the other thing they did, and it's not a disappointment that they didn't. Um, but still, that does it for all the questions. I don't know if that was actually 30, but I mean, I scrolled through a decent amount. I have... It says I have, tw oh, I'm sorry, I, I misread. I have 24 replies, so probably at least 15 to 18 questions were answered there. I did scroll through a few because they overlapped or they didn't really make sense. Some of them were, were not typed properly or they, they seemed kind of irrelevant to the conversation. So uh, with that being said, that will conclude another solo show by yours truly. I really appreciate you guys being understanding with this podcast as we've sort of gone back and forth between Carrick and I, myself, Carrick and I, myself. Um... Unless there's other preview events, which I, I don't see that happening, 
um, and it doesn't line up with some type of travel, which I'm not personally doing, then this should be the last style of this show for the foreseeable future. Um, but like I said, it seemed like you guys enjoyed it anyway, so I do appreciate that. So that'll do it for me, ladies and gentlemen. If you're new here, you enjoyed this entire listen, do remember we have a Patreon that you can support. You can get early access to this show for a single dollar. On top of that, it'll put you in the Discord for the patrons. Um, And that Discord features one of the best communities in gaming that I interact with pretty consistently. And I, I just love being there with those guys and gals. Really cool group of people. Really supportive, uplifting group of people. So that'll do it for me, ladies and gentlemen. And I'll catch you guys next time in a normal ham radio podcast, just like last time with Carrick and I. Stay sexy, stay active. I love you all. Peace.